Thank you so much, Paul, and Mir Blechus, Eric Herft, Dr. Fathik. Thank you all very much for being part of this tonight. Um, this really, both the Highland Whispers and working in any way with poetry, it goes back to a wonderful little festival called Solace, which takes place just outside of Perth. And I believe in the listeners tonight, uh, there's one of the new directors from the festival, which is really fantastic to see Deborah getting involved in uh, something that is a very special event. Out of that, I had the great good fortune to meet Podrick uh, and we've sort of stayed in touch uh, over the years and always thought, oh, wouldn't it be nice to do something together uh, at some point? And of course, those conversations often sit there in, in the ether and never do anything. But when lockdown came along, um, we were fortunate, myself and my husband, Nick, uh, to be based here in our Gower in Loch Haber on the west coast of Scotland. And we had a studio, a place where we could go to work and we wanted to be able to stay connected with other people. So Highland Whispers was, it's like an artistic game of consequences. And we took the five senses as a theme because they're the things that were, um, simultaneously deprived and overly heightened during lockdown um, and so each artist we had Podrick, um, Nick as a musician, uh, Anna Raven another Loch Haber painter, Toria Kane in Inverness uh, and Alex Boyd an Ayrshire photographer and Toria and Nick co-curated the whole the exhibition started off with one sense one artist and then followed a very convoluted little chain until each artist had um, dealt with uh, each of the senses. And I was the shepherd doing a, a very poor job of um, trying to keep them all pointing in the right direction. But we got to the end. Um, Toria and Nick created this beautiful online exhibition that you can see at highlandwhispers.co.uk. Um, but Toria also did, in that kind of in-between world that we inhabit right now, as she created an inside out exhibition in her own gallery in Aleppo, where the big windows that look out onto one of the main streets have boards with all uh, the works and little QR codes where you can listen to the music and listen to Pod reciting uh, his poems. So it was a compact but really quite powerful and emotional uh, exhibition. So if you're anywhere up in the Northwest, do go and visit it. It's going to be live there until the end of June. But otherwise, you can visit the website and there is an actual sort of virtual exhibition where you can wander around and encounter all the works. Magnificent. Um, I just dropped the link to the um, gallery I... into the chat there. So you can uh, go and have a look at that after the stories are finished. Um, we are really delighted that everybody is here. And we're going to jump right into the first story. And I'd like to invite Lorraine Rachmani to share your story. You're very welcome, Lorraine. Hi, thank you very much. I'll just start. I rock over and back, over and back. Feels like I'm in a boat on a gentle sea. I'm so groggy from sleep. I wonder where I am. Am I on a boat? I open my eyes and I remember I'm in the beach hut by the sea in Phuket. Ah, it must just be an earthquake. And I drift back to sleep, up gently in my bed by the air. I'd been in Japan for the last year, so being rocked in my bed by earthquakes was becoming surprisingly normal for someone who had grown up in the northwest of Ireland. When morning came, my friend was still fast asleep. So I got ready to go for a quick swim. Just as I went to leave, she came round and said, wait, I'll come too. So I went to, <clears throat> I went to wait on the porch. The smell of incense caught my attention and the sound of chanting. Across the road in front of the beach, shaking bunches of burning incense and chanting. Do you think she's sick of us tourists? I joked with my friend. But then I saw the strangest thing. Where the beach, there was now just water and sun umbrellas were swirling around and in it and, and there was a beach boy trying to fish them out. Where did all that water come from? It was like the sea had risen about 15 feet. My world shifted. What's going on? 
Then I remembered the rocking. There was an earthquake that alerted out. My friend and I looked at each other and at the same time shouted, Tsunami! The natural disaster training we'd received in Japan kicked in. We started to run. As we ran, a pickup truck stopped. We jumped in. Then my friend jumped out again. I can't go without my sister, she shouted as she ran away towards the hotel. I went to follow, but my family and my sisters at home came to mind. Torn, I stayed. More people piled into the truck. A mother and two children got pulled in. She handed me her baby. I held his pudgy little body close. He never cried once. The, trip, the truck took off and drove through the water, starting to flood the road, and we went up into the hills. We reached the top of the hill, and the truck pulled into a local family's home. They showered us with water and fruit under a canopy. I tried to eat, but everything felt like cotton wool in my mouth. I drank water and waited. Then another truck pulled in, screaming. The wave is coming. It's coming. Go higher, go higher. We all jumped into the back of the pickup again and took off. But we were on the top of a hill and there didn't seem to be anywhere higher to go. The roads were crazy. How do you escape a tsunami on an island? Drivers were changing their minds and changing direction on a one-way road. Cars and trucks were beeping and people shouting. At one point, a large lorry changed its direction suddenly and the back of the lorry swung so close to us in the pickup, we thought that might be the end. We're going to die on this road if we don't get off it, the mother shouted, and then started to direct the driver to her house. Her house turned out to be possibly the highest spot on the island, a penthouse in an enclosed community. She was the wife of a European ambassador. It was beautiful, peaceful and safe, but I just needed to get back. I just needed to find my friend and her family. It wasn't safe to leave, so we just had to wait. All the news poured in on the radio. Eventually, the mother came to me as I played with her son on the balcony and said, many people have died. You might not find your friend. I just needed to know. I just needed to go. So I traveled back with the pickup truck driver. There at the top of the hill above the beach where we stayed had now become like a town center. It was packed with cars and people everywhere. We drove slowly as I scanned the crowd. Stop, I said, stop, she's there, she's there. I scrambled out of the truck and into her and her sister's arms. We'd survived, we'd all survived. I'd taken the number of the mother I'd met and called her. We had nowhere else to go. She welcomed us all into her home. I woke up the next morning and just knew I couldn't go without trying to help someone. Why did I get to live when so many died? I joined the ambassador and his wife at the hospital. With a pen gripped tightly in my fingers and my songwriting notebook, I began to go from bed to bed. Page after page began to fill as people told me what they needed, where they were from, who they'd lost, if there was family I could contact for them. Somehow in the chaos, we created a system. Someone in Europe built a missing persons website for the ambassador and we began to fill it. We, we quickly became the go-betweens from the hospital patients to the embassies, reporting their whereabouts and that they needed new passports and help to get home. We cried tears of joy when we managed to reunite a four-year-old girl with her South African family. I held back tears as I spoke with the man's mother and told her that her son was alive, but that his girlfriend was missing. I visited the baby ward, but there was no notes that could be taken. Just little babies crying all in the same language. Without words, we couldn't tell what country they came from. By day three, the chaos began to be replaced by an eerie calm. The ambulance sirens arriving at the hospitals became less and less. The photo boards of missing people were becoming filled with pictures of bodies found. I couldn't look, I couldn't help, I had to go. I find myself a place to stay for the night in a college dorm. 
It was filled with lots of broken-hearted tourists waiting for passports and flights back home. As the sun set, unearthly sounds of a mother wailing rang out in the hallways. Tomorrow she would return home without her baby boy. He was only two when the wave took him. Nothing makes sense anymore. I rock over and back, over and back. This time it doesn't feel like I'm in a gentle, that I'm in a boat on this gentle sea. Thank you.